Some say the trouble's in the Pentagon. Some say the trouble's in the street. Welcome to Human Rights Here Now. I'm Lynn Dutton, your host, and today we're going to be talking about the human rights of prisoners in California prisons in solitary confinement. Today I have with me Willow Katz, Phyllis Greenleaf, and Steve Pleish. Yep. We're going to be talking about this topic and hopefully bringing to light a lot of the different things that have gone on in this particular area in the recent months. First off, let's start talking about the history of the prisoners' human rights movement here in California. Well, for decades, people in Pelican Bay State Prison Security Housing Unit, which is called the SHU, in solitary confinement, wrote to media and legislators and courts about the terrible conditions of torture in solitary confinement in Pelican Bay State Prison. They got no response and no changes from California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. So they announced that they were going to go on. They made five human rights demands of the California Department of Corrections. CDCR didn't do anything, didn't respond, didn't make any changes. What is CDDR? Cal California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation okay. is CDCR. Okay. So CDCR did not respond, did not make any changes. And so they announced that they were going to go on hunger strike um, for basic human rights within the prisons in solitary confinement. And they contacted family members and loved ones and contacted prison, prisoners' rights organizations and anti-prison organizations and let them know that they would be going on hunger strike if the demands weren't met. So in July, on July 1st, 2011, they started a hunger strike of over 6,600 prisoners inside California prisons. Um, Are these all solitary confinement uh, individuals at this point, or just prisoners in general? I believe that was mostly prisoners in solitary, but people outside were also in general population, also joined in. Um, they went on hunger strike about four weeks. They risked their health and their lives, um, and CDCR said that the demands were reasonable and that they would act, and so they suspended the hunger strike. But CDCR did not make the changes, so in September 2011, they went back on hunger strike, this time with about 12,000 prisoners. They, in, August 12, in August 2012, they issued the agreement to end hostilities across racial, ethnic, and geographic lines, which united prisoners of all different races and ethnicities to unify together, work together against prison abuse. Mm -hmm. This was something that uh, the guards really, in California prisons, they set up hostilities between people. They try to divide and conquer. So this was a really huge change for people to say, we're going to unite um, and we're going to work together for our human rights. So that, they then put out proposals for action, the prisoners, a strategic plan, um, which was one, to promote the agreement to end hostilities, two, to expose retaliation against the hunger strikers and against the people who were promoting the agreement to end hostilities, and three, they called for statewide coordinated actions to call for prisoners' human rights. And they said that they wanted to see the action grow from month to month as more people became aware of it and joined the struggle. And then in 2013, in July, based on the agreement to end hostilities, people came together and over 30,000 prisoners in California, and that was people in solitary confinement and general population, came together and did another hunger strike, started on July 8th, 2013. Over 100 people were on hunger strike for 60 days. That's a huge length of time. People are still suffering health damages from that. It was, it was a um, very serious and dangerous situation for people. People were really scared. Well, actually, someone did die. Billy Sells um, mm -hmm. died while on hunger strike. Legislators said that they would hold legislative hearings. Tom Amiano and Senator Lonnie Hancock said that they would hold legislative hearings about solitary confinement. And so they ended the hunger strike. And those legislative hearings did occur. The hunger strike was very successful in that it got 
the attention of the nation of California, the nation and worldwide. Um, UN paid attention to it. It got international press, and it really changed the consciousness in California and nationwide and internationally about solitary confinement. Because before that, the media didn't even use the term solitary confinement. They would use all these different words to describe it. CDCR, California Department of Corrections and Rehab, still denies that they have solitary confinement. But now the reality is known pretty widespread. Mm -hmm. People understand that it is massively used in the United States. You know, it's interesting uh, there, and as Rolla knows, and as Phyllis knows, there was a tremendous amount of local activism uh, statewide amongst the general population about people supporting uh, prisoners' rights at that time. I think a movement kind of started to grow at that time, led locally by our good friends at Simbaros, which is the local prison abolition and uh, reform organization. So uh, Santa Cruz uh, has been aware of this, and a lot of people around have worked hard to bring a lot of awareness to that, including the people sitting at this table. Okay. Uh, I believe that we have a video, the Molly Crabtree video, that uh, time for us to show. So if we could show that video at this point. In July 2013, 30,000 state prisoners went on hunger strike in California. The strike lasted for two months. It was the second one since 2011. The prisoners were protesting solitary confinement, what many people consider to be a form of torture. In solitary, your world is a gray concrete box. You spend between 22 and 24 hours a day alone in your cell. Your bed is a concrete slab with a thin mattress. Three times a week, guards shackle you and take you to the showers for 15 minutes. For exercise, you pace around another concrete box. Sometimes a bit of ceiling is uncovered. This is the only time you'll see the sky. As a punishment, the use of solitary confinement is often an arbitrary decision. Nearly 3,000 people are held in Pelican Bay State Prison in Crescent City, California. Over a third are in solitary, most of them because of quote-unquote gang affiliation. But that's a meaningless phrase. Gang affiliation might mean reading a book by a Black Panther, or drawing Aztec patterns, or even having a tattoo. But Pelican Bay isn't alone in this. Around the country, you can land in solitary for your art, your reading, your beliefs, your gender status, your sexual orientation, or your friends. Women have ended up in solitary after reporting being raped by guards. Transgender prisoners are often put in solitary just for being trans. Prisons say this is for their protection. There is no limit to how long someone can be held in solitary confinement, and very little evidence is needed to justify holding a person in solitary indefinitely. At Pelican Bay, hundreds of people have spent over a decade inside. According to the UN, 15 days in solitary confinement is torture that can cause permanent psychological damage. William Blake, who's been in solitary in a prison in New York State since 1988, said, Dying couldn't take but a short time if you or the state were to kill me. In SHU, I have died a thousand internal deaths. Solitary also enables abuse. The Dallas Six were inmates in Luzerne County. In 2009, they contacted human rights groups to complain about torture by guards. According to the Six, in the privacy of solitary, guards would starve prisoners, beat them, and strap them to restraint chairs for up to 18 hours at a time. In April 2010, guards beat and restrained a fellow prisoner. The Six covered their cell windows to draw the attention of a superior. In response, guards beat them bloody, and the prison charged them with rioting. The prison didn't explain how people can riot if they're locked alone in their cells. According to a lawyer for the Center for Constitutional Rights, prisoners in solitary are never granted parole. Because of this, a person sentenced to between 5 and 20 years can often spend the full 20 incarcerated. Prisoners' best hope for staying out of prison after release is maintaining bonds with loved ones while they're inside. But solitary destroys families. Those in solitary aren't even allowed contact visits. It was only after going on a brutal hunger strike that Pelican Bay inmate Gabriel Reyes got to hug his daughters. It had been 18 years. 
Many prisons even ban phone calls for those in solitary confinement. Personal letters may never be delivered. Books may be taken or withheld. This past November, U.S. officials told the United Nations Committee that, quote, there is no systematic use of solitary confinement in the United States. But as of 2013, this country was holding over 80,000 people in solitary confinement, some of whom were only 14 years old. Because of press and protests, there have been tiny reforms. Pelican Bay is reviewing the prisoners isolated because of gang affiliation. In September 2014, a memo by New York City's Correction Commissioner Joseph Ponte promised that Rikers Island would stop locking teens in solitary by the end of the year. But it's not enough. 80,000 humans remain alone in concrete boxes. When will they be out? That was a great video. Uh, anything you want to add about that video, uh, information that uh, associated with it? Well, yeah, in that video they said that there are 80,000 people in the United States who are in solitary confinement, but in 2014 um, there were actually up to 100,000 people in solitary confinement in prisons alone, and that doesn't include, there's untold numbers more in jails and juvenile facilities mm -hmm. wow. and detention centers. Okay, now you wanted to talk about uh, an agreement to end hostilities? Right, in 2012 in August, prisoners of all different races united together and put out an, an agreement to end hostilities, um, saying if we really want to bring about substantive changes to the CDCR system, we, have, we must collectively seize this moment in time and put an end to the 20 to 30 years of hostilities between our racial groups. And so this plan was implemented on October 10th, 2012, and people made a commitment that instead of fighting each other, they would unite together to fight, struggle for their human rights. Um, in March 2015, Todd Ashker, who's one of the principal negotiators for the Prisoner Human Rights Movement Collective, said, since we formed the Pelican Bay State Prison Short Corridor Collective in early 2011, the hunger strike leaders, now known as the Prisoner Class Human Rights Collective, we've made a lot of positive progress. Many of the collective members have been transferred out of Pelican Bay State Prison to other prisons, enabling them to more effectively promote our agreement and race-based hostilities. So he talked about the primary goal being to end long-term SHU, security housing units, solitary confinement, and ADSEG confinement and a secondary goal to end CDCR's exploitation of the prisoner class, including the outside loved ones and family members. So the CDCR has been using the violence by prisoners as an excuse to keep people in solitary confinement, but this agreement has decreased the violence within the prisons, yet CDCR has refused to promote it. They mm -hmm. haven't distributed it. They could, mm -hmm. they could give it to every prisoner in the prison system and really try to promote this and bring about more peace. But instead, they've actually retaliated against people who promote it. Um, it's been something that's been put into action, both in the prisons, in jails, in lockups on different levels, and in the communities. After the prisoners put out the agreement and hostilities, the Youth Justice Coalition in LA put out a similar agreement for youth and California Families Against Solitary Confinement has been working to unify people in the communities. And people have come together, people with loved ones inside have come together across all races and geographic places to go together to travel to the prison from Southern California all the way to the top of California by the Oregon State border where Pelican Base is. They do trips together. And Dolores Canales, who co-founded California Families Against Solitary Confinement, said that never could have happened before the agreement. Okay, uh, let's talk now about the five core uh, rules, and uh, the five core and the UN Mandela rules. Yes, okay, the five core human rights demands were the demands that were put out before the hunger strikes. Um, and they, they were put out in April 2011. Four principal negotiators of the prisoner class human rights movement put them out and negotiated for them, and 11 representatives negotiated with CDCR, but they did not respond. On December 17, 2015, just last month, 
the United Nations General Assembly unanimously adopted the Mandela Rules. They were, in 1955, the UN established the standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. And just this year, they got revised and renamed the Mandela Rules after President Mandela of South Africa, who struggled against apartheid, who was in prison for 27 years and served years in solitary confinement. For the first time in international law, there's been limits set on solitary confinement. Um, and these rules back up the human rights demands of the prisoners. So I'm going to go through some of the demands and the comparison with the Mandela rules. So first of all, um, the Mandela rules define solitary confinement as the confinement of prisoners for 22 hours or more a day without meaningful contact, human contact. Countries are encouraged to use the Mandela rules in their national legislation, but there's no court that can enforce it. Okay, so the five core human rights demands. One is to end group punishment and administrative abuse. And the Mandela rule, number 43, prohibits collective punishment. What they've done is they use safety and concern as an excuse to put people into solitary confinement long term. It's group punishments by race and geography. Number two of the human rights demands is to abolish the debriefing policy and modify active inactive gang status criteria. Debriefing is when somebody who's in solitary confinement snitches on someone else in order to get out themselves mm -hmm. and turn somebody else and get somebody else put into solitary. Um, there's no 14th Amendment right to due process, so if a person snitches on someone, there's no way for them to uh, get the it's secret witness, secret they evidence. Can't they can't confront their accuser or That's anything right. like that. And there's no trial, there's no jury, there's no judge, so there's no 14th amendment due process. The rule, the third human rights demand was comply with the U.S. Commission on Safety and Abuse in America's Prisons recommendations to end long-term solitary confinement. So that talks about releasing people to general population who have been in for 10 to 40 years, which is quite common in California, long-term sentences inside solitary confinement to provide access to natural sunlight and quality health care, which you saw in the video. There's no sunlight, no, no fresh air, no windows. And to transfer people with chronic health problems to a medical facility. In 2011, at Pelican Bay State Prison alone, over 500 men had lived in solitary for over 10 years, and 78 people for over 20 years. The U.S. is the outlier in the world with solitary. It uses puts more people in solitary for longer terms than any other country or government. And California, within the U.S., is the outlier. So there's been up to 14,000 people in solitary confinement in California prisons. Now, is solitary confinement, is this an actual sentence, or is this... As I understand it, this is something that is administratively inst instructed. Exactly. It's not part of their sentence, and it's not based on violence or behavior. Most people who are in solitary, long-term solitary confinement were either political leaders, cultural leaders, um, jailhouse lawyers, people who learned law in order to litigate against prison abuse mm -hmm. inside the prison. <clears throat> people who um, expose prison abuse, people who are raped or sexually abused who expose that are put into solitary confinement. LGBTIQ people are put into solitary. So um, they want to isolate those people. Right. Because those people can be prison educators mm -hmm. and right. prison organizers. Right. Mm. And one thing also to note is that uh, one thing the ACLU has objected to in terms of it not only being punitive, but using it for rehabilitation purposes. And that is exactly what needs not to be done. Rehabilitation. Yeah, exactly. That's like a joke. Right. So how does this line up with international human right law? OK, well, point? let me go finish going through the um, demands. And then I'll get okay. to the international. Um, so then the, the um, called for an end to the conditions of isolation. So 
They called for meaningful human contact, um, freedom from extreme physical deprivations, using solitary only as a last resort. And this corresponds with the UN Mandela Rule 43, which prohibits indefinite solitary confinement and defines prolonged solitary confinement as over 15 consecutive days as torture. So then um, some of the conditions of confinement, they're locked in, as it showed in the video, they're locked in a tiny cell, 23 hours a day, no access to natural light, substandard medical care, food is fed twice a day through a slot, um, no treatment for mental health, the lights are on or off all the time. It's, cl it's clearly torture. They're not allowed to uh, communicate with families. The only phone calls that they get is if someone dies, and there's times when somebody in the family dies and they still don't get that phone call. Um, this violates Mandela Rule 43, um, which prohibits the prohibition of family contact. Human rights demand number four was to provide adequate nutrition, nutritious food, and the Mandela Rule says that they cannot reduce a prisoner's diet or drinking water, and five is expand programming. Okay. Um, I think at this point we should go to the Reader's Theater ah, yes. and do that. So right now, uh, Steve and uh, Phyllis are going to be reading some of the, uh, write, I believe that the writings of prisoners that have been experiencing solitary confinement. And it's really a very exciting exercise for us. We do it at our monthly uh, statewide coordinated actions to abolish solitary confinement. And people really love to hear the, the human story about what solitary confinement does, not only to the prisoner itself, but to their families. So it's, uh, it's very dramatic. Okay. So I'm reading the voice of Marie Levin. I'm Marie Levin. My older brother, Ronnie Sitawa, has been held in the security housing unit at Pelican Bay State Prison since 1990, a circumstance that is truly cruel and unusual punishment. When I heard about the inhumane conditions in the shoe, I broke down crying uncontrollably. Ronnie lives in a cramped, windowless cell for at least 22 and a half hours a day. He is let out of his cell only to exercise alone in a concrete enclosure and to shower three times weekly. He is allowed no phone calls. His food is often cold and rotten. Ronnie has severe vitamin D deficiency. He also suffers from high blood pressure and has at times been denied his medication. He says that being in the shoe feels like psychological torture. It's traumatizing knowing that a loved one is suffering and there's nothing I can do about it. The drive is almost eight hours. Traveling and lodging are expensive for me. After the long and costly trip, we are only permitted to visit for one to two hours through a piece of glass. My name is Sitawa Nantambu Jama'a. I'm one of the five principal negotiators of the Pelican Bay State Prison Hunger Strike, now titled Pelican Bay Human Rights Movement. I've been in solitary confinement since 1990 and I've suffered every torturous physical and psychological attack known to man here. I've been held in solitary illegally because of two heartless racist officials who lied in order to lock me up as a prison gang member. When they both knew I was not, I was told off the record that I am in solitary for my political beliefs. This is not a unique story. Many other prisoners are held in solitary indefinitely for not one offense for 10 to 40 plus years. We have wasted away here while our families suffer the same psychological torture and many have already passed on. Know that our hunger strike is about human rights and the abuse and physical and psychological torture of prisoners being held in solitary confinement indefinitely. That is civil death. Despite all the divide and conquer attempts, we prisoners remain in solidarity across all racial groups. Our Pelican Bay Human Rights Movement is a struggle to be treated like decent human beings. I'm Dolores Canales. In 2011, my son John asked me to forward a letter announcing, quote, a hunger strike to protest the denial of our human rights and equality via the use of perpetual solitary confinement, unquote. 
I read his letter at a community gathering and said, I'm just a mom who wanted her son to eat. I spent nine months in the shoe at the California Institution for Women in 1999. You don't experience human contact other than being handcuffed and escorted places. My visits were non-contact behind the glass and there would be times that I would wake up at night because the cells are so small and I would just feel like, like I couldn't breathe. And I guess that's why I really did start thinking about the situation of solitary confinement for decades on end. And that's why I organize with such passion because California leaves people for 20, 30, 40 years. And then I realized that they had no intention of letting my son out, that we had to do something. Sitawa here again. In our statement issued following the September 1, 2015 class action settlement legal victory, plaintiffs collectively stated, this settlement represents a monumental victory for prisoners, an important step toward our goal of ending solitary confinement in California and across the country. California's agreement to abandon and terminate SHU SHU confinement based on gang affiliation demonstrates the power of unity and collective action. This victory was achieved by the efforts of people in prison, their families and loved ones, lawyers and outside supporters. Our movement rests on a foundation of unity, our agreement to end hostilities. It is our hope that this groundbreaking agreement to end the violence between the various ethnic groups in California prisons will inspire not only state prisoners, but also jail detainees, county prisoners, and other communities on the street to oppose ethnic and racial violence. From this foundation, the prisoners' human rights movement is awakening the conscience of the nation, turning against solitary confinement. We celebrate this victory while at the same time we recognize that achieving our goal is fundamentally transforming the criminal justice system and stopping the practice of warehousing people in prison will be a protracted struggle. We are fully committed to that effort and invite you to join us. I'm Marie Levin and I'm very grateful for this lawsuit and for all the support that has been given to Pelican Bay prisoners since the hunger strikes. This movement to end these barbaric conditions had, has lifted Ronnie's spirits as well. In early November, my brother and I had our first visit at Salinas Valley State Prison without glass between us. We were able to touch for the first time in 31 years. Not long ago, human rights activists and families were protesting outside the prison here, and this is a Sotawa again, because of a new security check system that started in the security in the secure housing unit, where the staff came around every 30 minutes to check on us. They're saying it's for our own safety and to make sure we're not hurting ourselves. It actually started a little after the last hunger strike in other prisons, but was just implemented here a few months ago. This new system is really more of another form of torture and added sleep deprivation to our already torturous conditions by constantly banging on our cell doors, shining flashlights in our faces, and beeping loud noises that can be heard going on and off on each floor all day and night, waking us up each time. So we really haven't had a good night's sleep since it started, and we're all walking around like zombies from lack of sleep. I'm Dolores Canales. I visited my son, John Martinez, in the Pelican Bay Shoe on September 12th. And he's going crazy from not being able to sleep. I've never seen him like this before. He couldn't think, and he fell asleep while I was talking to him from across the glass partition. My name is John R. Martinez. On August 24th, I began a hunger strike and told staff that the security welfare check procedure was depriving me of sleep and harming my physical and mental well-being. I wrote CDCR, deprivation of sleep is a common form of torture. Sleep is a basic human need and a fundamental constitutional right. The court should order the CDCR to eliminate the sleep deprivation procedure because it serves no legitimate purpose other than harassment to immediately cease depriving me of adequate sleep by waking me up every 30 minutes in violation of my fundamental Eighth Amendment constitutional right 
to be free from cruel and unusual punishment. Without the court's intervention, there is a reasonable probability that life-threatening injuries and even death is inevitable as medical symptoms are worsening but not being treated. Thank you very much, yeah. both of you, for, for reading that. Let's, let's talk about what's gone on here in California recently in terms of the Ashker judgment that came down on September 1st. Okay, September 1st, 2015, there was a settlement of a federal action lawsuit, class action lawsuit that had been started, initiated by Todd Ashker, who was one of the principal negotiators of the prisoner class human rights movement. He was a brilliant jailhouse lawyer who started the case and then it became a federal class action lawsuit on behalf of 500 men who had lived in solitary over 10 years in Pelican Bay and 78 for over 20 years. It said that California was violating prisoners' 8th and 14th Amendment rights, the 8th Amendment right to be free of cruel and unusual treatment, and the 14th Amendment right to due process. So CDCR, despite saying that there's no solitary confinement, settled because they didn't want to go to trial and be exposed to the world for the horrors of the conditions in solitary. So they settled a case that said that about 2,000 people are going to get out of security housing units within a year. Um, so that's why the guards are really upset. They don't want to be having people get out of solitary confinement. Um, this affects adults. It doesn't affect youth. So this year, there's going to, that last year, there was a Senate Bill 124 by Senator Leno to define and limit youth solitary confinement. That was killed in the Appropriations Committee. So this year, we're going to work really hard. It's called, being called the Stop the Torture of Children Act. Mm. And this year, we're going to work really hard to get that passed. Um, it'll limit solitary confinement for, to four hours. What about sleep deprivation? This OK, so because of the guards being angry about the settlement, they have started this process that was described in the Reader's Theater about waking people up every 30, 20 to 30 minutes mm -hmm. with really loud noise, banging of, of steel doors, mm -hmm. uh, stomping of guards through the pods, jangling of keys, banging pipes on the cells to say, um, check that they're in their cell, um, shining their flashlights into prisoners' eyes. And so they're saying that it's to prevent suicide. But this kind of cruel sleep deprivation Day and night they're doing this, 48 times a day, is causing really serious psychological and physical harm. Mm. Prisoners are sleep deprived and they're suffering severe stress, weight loss, dizziness, nausea, palpitations, fast heartbeats, stomach and bowel problems. It's really serious such situation. It's been going on for over five mm. months. Uninterrupted sleep is very necessary for basic health for numerous neurological and physiological functioning. And sleep it's deprivation. It's a human right. It's a human right. Sleep it's a basic is a human, human need. right. That's right. And sleep deprivation causes a numerous, numerous chronic and potentially terminal illnesses and conditions. Okay. Uh, let me ask, uh, should we go ahead and do the uh, sleep deprivation video at this point? Yeah, that'd be good. I think we should go to the video for the sleep deprivation that we have, if we could show that. At this point. We're here at 1550 S Street, the Department of Corrections in Sacramento, on November 30th, 2015. It will be 120 days, 24 hours a day in the Pelican Bay shoe of being woke up every 20 to 30 minutes with loud banging, doors banging, 
Guards stomping up and down the stairs, keys jingling, metal pipes, his guard wants just a metal pipe banging into it next to the door. Thousands of prisoners are being deprived of normal sleep in a policy, a Dragonian policy that was just recently instituted by the Department of Corrections for waking prisoners up every half hour to see if they, in fact, are alive. When it comes to uh, care, whether that's mental health care, or medical care, or just day-to-day -day care, CDC does not care. And whether they got guards stopping at, at people's cells every 20 to 30 minutes or not, they're not paying attention to how people are doing inside those cells. <laughs> deprivation. They call it a wellness check or a welfare check, but you're keeping them from sleeping, which adds to mental disorders, which adds to uh, physical ailments. It, it's just, it's, it's a countless number of things that can happen to these guys. I have a condition called sleep apnea. I've been told by physician after physician, if I don't put my mask on that allows me to sleep during the night without stop breathing and waking up, that I could have a stroke, I could have a heart attack. There's a whole list of things that could happen to you. It seems to me that this department is creating conditions that are similar to sleep apnea. It wakes you up. It's supposed to be dangerous for you. That's what the doctors say. If you deprive someone of sleep, for many hours, and if you're woke up every 30 minutes, uh, then you can have a lot of problems health-wise. Uh, your body needs to regenerate, and it does this during sleep. And if you're sleep deprived, it cannot generate, degener I mean, regenerate the way it's supposed to. Uh, the mind needs to sleep. If the mind does not get rest, it will begin to hallucinate. We can only take so much sleep deprivation. There was a sleep expert recently who said, um, was asked if they'd ever done an experiment where they woke somebody up over and over and over and over, over days. And they said, we would not be able to do that experiment because it would be unethical. Families have gone there and have been told by the same people this is happening to how they're feeling and they're not feeling very, very well. They can't hold it together. They're falling apart. They're uh, on the verge of possibly even suicide. The same suicide watch that this Dragonian policy is supposed to be. Exactly. You know, the sleep deprivation looks like it's a, something that should not be done. What, are, what can people do at this point? Okay, we've got a campaign for people to make calls to demand a stop to the sleep deprivation torture in Pelican Bay Shoe and other prisons that's happening as well, um, to call the governor, to call the California Department of Corrections, to call Senator Lonnie Hancock, Assembly Member Bill Quirk. They're in charge of the public safety committees of the Senate and the Assembly. We have a letter for people to sign that goes to the governor and the public safety committees of the Senate and Assembly. Um, there's an emergency response network people can join to deal with situations where there are emergencies, this and other emergencies, um, where you contact the governor or legislators or CDCR or whoever has the power to change those situations. So people can go to prisonerhungerstrikesolidarity.wordpress.com 
and also on Facebook, Prisoner Hunger Strike Solidarity, and also on Facebook, Rally Against the Torture of Prisoners, to get more information on the exact phone numbers to call. We're also asking organizations to make statements. For example, ACLU would be terrific to make statements against the sleep deprivation torture. It's a very serious, dangerous situation. It's been going on over five months. There's going to be an event coming up Monday, uh, February 1st. There's going to be an emergency demonstration at the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation headquarters in Sacramento at 1 p.m. Anyone who can go, we're, trying to, we're organizing carpools from throughout the state. Uh, that'll be 1 p.m. at Sacramento CDCR headquarters at 1515 S Street in Sacramento. Um, we've got to stop this torture. It's, it's a really, really dangerous situation. Also, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, my question is, you know, you've talked about it being done at Pelican Bay. Is uh -huh. this actually being done with any of the juvenile uh, offenders? Yeah, and that's that are... a question we really need to address, yeah. The sleep deprivation torture, I don't know about it happening with, with youth, um, but I do know that it's happening with women on death row at Cal Central California Women's Facility and the CIW, Cent uh, California Institution for Women, SHU, Security Housing Unit for women there. They're doing the, the wellness checks there, the so-called welf welfare checks there, um, but, and depriving people of sleep. So it's a situation that's happening in different California prisons. I don't know that it's, I, do, I haven't heard anything about it happening in the youth okay. but, facilities. But I think one thing that, that, that I wanted to go back to that I think we really have directly addressed is the use of solitary confinement in juvenile facilities. And that happens in California. It happens all over California. And there are some restrictions on it, but not entirely. I know that, that uh, Senator Leno uh, is now uh, offering legislation that's going to either restrict that uh, much more or abolish it entirely. But that's something that happens to our children you know, mm -hmm. in juvenile facilities, in solitary confinement. It's not simply you know, older adults who happen to find themselves in San Quentin or Pelican Bay or places like that. It's juveniles in juvenile facilities. That's and that child is something, abuse. That's child abuse, and that simply has to be addressed. You know? the, the other thing, you know, I recently watched on Frontline, uh, there was a program that they did about solitary confinement uh, in a facility in Maine where they were trying to reduce the amount of it. Uh, and they had, you know, it was a very uh, tough program to watch, let's put it that way, because people did involve, uh, people on the program, prisoners, uh, literally did cut themselves, uh, to cut their veins to the point where they were bleeding ex profusely. Mm. Uh, uh, the guards were checking up on them, but they only had like a glass window to check up on them. And the prisoners would cover them, so, cover up the window so that they couldn't see in, and then they would cut themselves, and then they would have to open the door, and they would, in essence, use a SWAT team, if you will, of guards to to do that. Uh, you know, the psychological damage that solitary confinement does to a full-grown man that isn't prepared for it, and then to have, you know, juveniles or children subjected to the same thing, it has to be. A huge impact and, and and I find it strange that we've gotten to this point and this is not actually a sentence uh, part of the sentencing structure this is something that is artificially imposed for uh, minor violations as small as having six books in your uh, in, in your cell versus five books mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. called it's torture we need to use the word torture mm -hmm. that prisons are getting away with this I assume Senator Monning is working on this? Well, I, I think it, it's uh, just as important to speak about the horrors of solitary confinement as it is to talk about the fact that, that activist groups uh, like Simbaros, like Skates, like the people who've done that, are actually getting some traction across the state. And with Asker, there has been uh, it's supposed to be a, re a, a reduction of 
solitary confinement in California. Uh, the ACLU, and I'm, uh, I'll pause to say that they've been a, a champion of prisoners' rights for some considerable time. The ACLU locally is a supporter of the statewide actions against solitary confinement, which we have every month, uh, also in Northern California. But in New York, uh, they just had a, a settlement uh, a year ago where they uh, agreed to reform their entire solitary confinement procedures. And I'll read you just a portion of it to, to show that there are some inroads being made. It's not all bad news. It's a horrific situation but there are some gains being made. And I'll Good. say this, New York State has done the right thing committing to comprehensive reform of the way it uses extreme isolation, a handful of inhumane practices that have been going on for years and used as punishment as a first resort in New York State's prisons. By entering into this agreement, the Cuomo administration has shown that it has the vision to transform New York into a national leader in the movement toward alternatives to a solitary confinement and has prioritized the safety of prisoners prisoner staff, and New York community. So it's important to know that there are some... Uh, Good news. Uh, there, there is some, some, some glimmer of hope, you know, that yes. people are really assessing this in the light of it being torturous and as being, you know, psychologically and physically demeaning. But nevertheless, there are good things happening. So the New York Civil Liberties Union. Let's follow Union. New York. Yeah. Right. That, that was done, negotiated by the New York Civil Liberties Union with the state of New York. It was announced on December 16th, 2015. That's going to let out about 1,100 people out of traditional solitary confinement, and it's going to limit the duration of Good. time that people can be in. People won't be able to be in for minor violations. There'll be increased day rooms, group day rooms and programming, increased use of outdoor space and rehabilitation. And it's going to eliminate some of the most dehumanizing features of solitary confinement. Uh, people will get telephone calls, be able to get more reading materials. Mm -hmm. They're abolishing the use, the serving of inedible food, which Hallelujah. has been a starvation diet that Hallelujah. they use, which is another thing that the Mandela rules, the United Nations Mandela well, rules yeah. prohibit the what, what restriction kind of, of diet. What were they doing so, with the diet? So there's a food that they call the loaf that's uh, like potato and bread or soy. It's pretty, it sounds like it's really disgusting and inedible. And they've been serving that and they're going to stop serving that. They're not going to be able to give them that food anymore. Is our governor so, taking the lead? Is he going to follow the New our, York governor? Our governor is not taking the lead. Our governor is a racist who's been supporting. No, but the, I mean, now we have the New York governor who's taken a, a, a lead, the lead. Well, no, actually, California's settlement came first. In no, I mean on this September new one, December 16th. Right, right. So September 1st, the California Asker settlement happened. Okay. That's going to get about 2,000 people out of solitary. Mm -hmm. It's going to create new kind of um, restrictive general population unit. A lot of people are getting out, like the stories that you read um, about Marie and Satawa being able to visit in general population. Dolores Canales mm -hmm. just got to visit her son. He's now in Salinas Valley Prison in Soledad. So there are positive changes. But no, Governor Brown is not. Governor Brown was um, the accused in the lawsuit. It was, a, it was uh, Ashker versus Governor Brown. Brown. Yeah. Because he is leading the torture. He is not taking Well, a let's get Governor role. Brown to so behave have, himself. So people should call Governor Brown. He wasn't born a racist. Mm -hmm. what, right. So we, we do he have. He wasn't born that so way. So phone calls to Governor Brown are part of the campaign to end the sleep deprivation torture, and people should put pressure on him to end the torture of solitary confinement. What if, are there any cases that are coming up before the Supreme Court? I mean, you know, from what I understand of the history of the use of solitary confinement, it really didn't get started until the late 1800s, uh, way past the formation of the Constitution uh, and however that's put together. And it was not used generally. In fact, it was, you know, first start off by the Quakers, as I understand right. it. And it's where we get the word penitentiary. Quakers thought that... But uh, solitary was used during slavery. But as a, pun as a general punishment for the for the free men, let's put it that way. Uh, the Quakers were using it, uh, hopefully they thought that people put into these places would become penitent uh, in for their For rehabilitation isolation. purposes, not punitive purposes. Yes. Exactly right, yeah. Uh, and it wasn't used for all that long either at that point in time. So it would seem to me on a constitutional basis that it would be clear that this would be uh, cruel and unusual punishment yeah. and there should be cases in front of yeah. the, the U.S. Supreme Court 
uh, for this. Yeah. And, uh, and so in it, June, yeah. Supreme Court Justice Kennedy spoke out against solitary confinement. It was not a case about solitary, but it was in a, a concurring decision that he wrote for another case in which the, the man had been in solitary confinement and he talked about the history of solitary confinement as being torturous and having ter doing terrible harm to people. And he basically was inviting a Supreme Court case. Um, the case of Albert Wood Fox, who's been in solitary confinement for over 40 years. Uh, he's one of the Angola three. Yeah, I thought they were Louisiana, yeah. Right. Um, his case is probably going to be taken to the Supreme Court. How come it's taken so long for this to rise to it? Because I would think, you know, based on the psychological well, studies and impact that are obvious. Uh, know, part of it, I think, as activists, we're never more effective than when we change the narrative. And the narrative on this for so long has been the constitutional narrative in the United States of cruel and unusual. What we're trying to use now is the international narrative, which is cruel and inhuman. Mm -hmm. And if something's inhuman, then that raises a le to a level of where people are more you know, concerned about, well, is this being used and why, and should it be used at all? And so social, a lot of it is changing a narrative. Yeah. Social isolation is a dehumanizing thing. Whether we time out little children as punishment and mm -hmm. isolate them from their peers, mm -hmm. any form of social isolation is dehumanizing. We know that, that my background's child development. Mm. Social isolation dehumanizes human beings. We need each other. We need each other. Being isolated is not rehabilitation, ever. So one of the th so I think that the hunger strikes that the prisoners did really totally changed people's perspective because before that society wasn't really looking at it. But the suffering, it was the prisoners inside, the people locked up in these terrible conditions and their family members and loved ones also suffer that torture. And they came out and really raised the issue. With the hunger strikes, people had to deal with it. And um, the people in, locked up inside proposed that we do statewide coordinated actions to end solitary confinement, which started on March 23rd of 2015. And they're on the 23rd because? And they're on the 23rd to highlight the 23 and more hours a day that people ah. are locked up yeah. inside, alone in their cell. They're supposed to get an hour a day of exercise. That exercise is in another concrete block. Still no sunlight, no fresh air. Still alone. And it's too bad we didn't have a, a video of that because that is just uh, so dramatic and heartbreaking to see. Yes, you know. it is. Yeah. Right. So they called for statewide coordinated action to end solitary confinement, which started March 23rd throughout the state of California, also in, P in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia. And they have become nationwide in um, the campaign Together to End Solitary. So actions happen on the 23rd of every month throughout the state of California, in New York, in Boston, and other places. They've happened in Florida and Chicago. So they're spreading nationwide. A number of organiz nationwide organizations and have gotten happens. involved. And ours happens on the 23rd of every month. It'll be, the next one will be Saturday, January 23rd. 12.30 to 2 p.m. at the corner of Pacific and Cooper. We do that Come on every out. month. Come on out. Join us. We, we're there at Bring the 23rd of every month, 12.30 to Bring 2. Bring guitars and banjos. And they can hear more Reader's Theater if they enjoyed that. Uh, and they can participate. Yeah, you, you can participate, participate in, in like. the Reader's Theater. Yeah. yeah. And we come early and we talk to passers-by. We give leaflets. We um, talk to people. People have been really moved and signing letters to the governor and this and the state assembly uh, the safety public committees of the senate and the assembly and signing up to help so we're having an impact on people as we're there Repression. and it's and it's happening yeah. Throughout the country. And we have a wonderful leader yes, named Willow <laughs> who is inspiring us. Let, let me ask one question. This is a local question. What use here within Santa Cruz County is there of solitary confinement? Um, well, I went on a tour of the Santa Cruz County Jail with Sheriff Hart, and he pointed out, he said, oh, well, we put people in solitary confinement, we put mentally ill people in solitary confinement. Well, anyone with mental health issues 
doesn't need torture. They need mental health care. They need mm -hmm. mental health treatment. They need services. They need groups, support groups. Or and there also is a restraint chair over there. That they there's a the restraint that chair, and there good. was a, a black man put in that restraint chair for hours and yeah. not allowed to use the phone, not allowed to use the toilet. He reported it to Santa Cruz County. Which is a not-so-subtle form of, of County. isolating you. Right, right and uh, that's totally torture. So do, do, how many people do we have in solitary confinement in Santa Cruz County right now? I don't know the numbers. Our local jail but capacity is about, well, it's at, Brent actually running at about 120% capacity. There's about 310 inmates over there. So I don't know on any given day how many are in solitary how confinement, many, but it's a very good question. Do, do we know how many, you know, I would assume that there's special cells that have to be used for solitary confinement. Right. Uh, how, do you have any idea how many of those type cells or restraint mm -hmm. chairs that are currently available? I've only heard of one restraint chair, but I don't know yeah. if they have more. I, I um, would like but they, yeah. they did, he did point out at least several solitary confinement cells, and he talked about not only putting mentally ill people in solitary, but also he talked about different gangs. Now, the thing about the gang members is people get put labeled gangs just based on what race or ethnicity our, they our, are. Our time is starting to run out. Uh, right at this moment, I'd like for us to talk, you know, to repeat of the upcoming events, the 23rd here in Santa Cruz. There's also one coming up in Sacramento. There's a few events coming up. Okay. February 1st in so Sacramento. February 1st at 1 p.m. in Sacramento at the headquarters of the California Department of Corrections. Maybe we should also take a train got, up. We could take the Capitol Corridor up. <laughs> also on the 24th, the day after the rally, at 2 p.m., the ACLU is having their annual election event. And there will be an honoring of that here in my, Santa Cruz. Yeah, it could be it's Michael's, on, Michael's Maine. on Maine. And are this year's honoree for the Hammer of Justice Award is our own Willow Cat. Ah, yeah. oh. congratulations! Uh, right for the work very to well abolish deserved. solitary confinement. Very, very confinement. pleased to be able to award her that. And I'm very pleased to be able to accept it on behalf and in honor of the people who are locked up and their family members, because they're the ones who have suffered the torture and have really led the work to end solitary confinement. On February 7th, there's going to be a showing of the film, the far, film by Nearcat, National Religious Campaign Against Torture, Breaking Down the Box, Exposing the Torture of Solitary Confinement. That's going to be seven, Sunday, February 7th, 3 to 5 p.m. at Temple Beth L mm. in Aptos. And we'll have small discussion groups after the film with Marie Levin, mm -hmm. who we heard from in the Reader's Theater. Marie will is from California Families Against Solitary Confinement. She'll be coming to help facilitate a small group. And also Cynthia Fuentes okay. of California Families Against Solitary Confinement. I, I think we're out of time at this point, and I want to thank you. We'll put up on the screen as we're closing out some of the contact uh, points that people can get a hold of information at this time. And I want to thank Willow for coming and being the, the spokesman for this and Lee being the hammer of justice. Spokes, Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Phyllis Katz, of Phyllis course. Ka Phyllis Katz. <laughs> Phyllis Greenlee. Phyllis Greenlee. Phyllis Greenlee. Phyllis Greenlee. Some say the trouble's in the Pentagon. Some say the trouble's in the street. Some say the president's a paragon. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Some say the trouble's the anatomy. Some say.